All right. Welcome, AHA coaches. We're really excited to have you on today's call with Corey Schwab. He's our goaltending coach for the Arizona Coyotes. Um, just quick, um, quick little reminders. We do have the ability to ask Corey some questions at the end of his chat today. So go ahead and drop those in the Q&A box and we'll get those at the end of his segment. And then we have um, also Joe who will be joining us after um, Corey is done with his segment, but I'll go ahead and let Shane take it away with all the introductions. All right. Well, thank you, Christina. And thank you all for being on here again. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for helping out and making sure we get this all done. Christina and Mike obviously are spearheading all this and making sure you guys get an opportunity to listen to our coaches and to Joe. Thank you so much for USA Hockey for including us and allowing us to kind of use this as a platform to help our coaches here in the state. We're pretty lucky to have, uh, like I said, our head coach and now all of our assistant coaches come online. And they do an amazing job. Um, Schwab is someone that I've got to know pretty good over the years. Um, we joke and tease each other a lot. Uh, I am so impressed with what he does with our goaltenders. It is so incredible. Uh, he joined the Coyotes on the coaching side, I think in 15, 16. So I was still playing when he joined. Um, and he was a guy that uh, it's been amazing when you look at the goalies that have went through the, the organization and the success that they've had here. It's been one of the backbones of the teams for the last few years because of what Schwabi's done. I think you look at what is going on this year and you look at Veggie and you look at Iggy and you can't help but thank Schwabi for doing his job so, so well. He came into the league, uh, I think he came into the NHL in 95, 95-ish, 96-ish. He was in New Jersey. Him and John Madden played together. They won a Stanley Cup in 03 together, which is obviously pretty cool. And Schwabi, did you, you won the, he won the Calder Cup as well, I think in like 94, 95 or 95, 96, right around there? Is that Yeah, Schwab? it was the 1995 Calder Cup which the Devils won the Stanley Cup that year as well and had the opportunity to uh, be a black ace and see what it's all about as they went through the... And you played 10 games that year, or 12, 15 games? Or I thought you played something like that that year, right? Uh, no, the next year I did. Yeah. Next year you did. Yeah. But we are so fortunate to have Schwabi, as I got to spend a lot more time with him in the last couple months here. And uh, his ability to work with the goalies, protect the goalies, and not only that, but his pulse of the dressing room is absolutely incredible. He's someone that I have huge respect for and somebody that I really enjoyed getting to know better and better. He has the driest sense of humor, and I never know if he's actually making fun of me or not. <laughs> but at the same time, it, uh, it's been something I've really enjoyed. Thank you, Schwabi. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Christina. Take it away, Schwabi. We're all yours. Well, Shane, thanks for the introduction. And uh, it's been great having you helping our staff. And it's great for what you do for the uh, youth hockey in Arizona. And for those of you who, who don't know, I had uh, I have two boys that uh, played part of their youth hockey here in Arizona. Uh, they played high school hockey as well as uh, travel hockey for both the programs of uh, the Bobcats and the Coyotes. And they're both uh, they've gone on and one's playing junior hockey and the other one is playing uh, division three college hockey. So I'm grateful for what the state of Arizona and the state of Washington, where I was before that, but just uh, USA hockey in general is what, uh, what they've been able to do for my kids. Uh, today, we're going to talk about puck handling with uh, goaltenders. Uh, it's a, it's a skill that as an NHL goalie coach, when a goalie can handle the puck, it's a huge help for our defensemen and our team. And it's something that I enjoyed doing as a, as a goalie. And I worked on it a lot as a young kid uh, growing up. And like I said earlier, I have uh, one son who's a goalie and he took a liking to it. And there's always ways that you can uh, be working on it, whether it be in practice on your own or with a coach or even at home while you're doing some just shooting pucks against a wall. Or uh, I used to take my, bag of pucks to the schoolyard and shoot it against the, against the backstop just to try to uh, get some strength in my forearms and uh, stick handling with balls. So I'm going to go through a couple of uh, uh, situations with different viewpoints from 
the camera angles that I would use when I'm reviewing the goalie touches, that's what we call it with our goalies. Uh, we go over it regularly, pretty much after every game, I'll go over it just so that they can get the viewpoint of, hey, this is what is happening when you have your back turned to the play. And I think that's important for a lot of coaches to understand is a goalie's going back, he'll get his initial look when the player is the four checkers coming either at the blue line or they might be at the top of the circle. And then they got to turn and they have their back to the play. So it's important that the defensemen are communicating with the goalie and there is eyes because sometimes you don't have time to stop it and take a look. But if you develop the, understand the patterns that the four checkers are going and then it's up to the coaching staff to decide um, what you want your defenseman to do, whether you're coming back and picking the puck up behind the net all the time, which the goalie would be leaving it, or you're playing it uh, either up the side that it came in on or over to the far side. So we'll go over some of, some of those, try to give you a little sense of what our guys see and the amount of pressure and the lack of time that they have to make a decision. They have to know what they're doing. Each level, I understand that, um, you know, all the goalies aren't gonna be confident playing the puck, uh, but I think it's important that they start out by at least making the attempt to come out and stop a rim and setting it up in the proper spot. And from there, as they get older and stronger and a little more confident, maybe they can help, uh, help your team, help their teammates out. Um, breaking out faster, but most importantly, preventing your defenseman from getting hit. If a goalie can help out in that way and prevent a couple hits, maybe a couple injuries, or maybe a defenseman having a little more confidence going back to the puck, it's gonna help your overall team game. Um, so I will uh, bring up my video and share my screen here. You guys see it here? So the first one here is, is gonna be a leave it as we call it. So he's gonna leave it, he's picking it up on his forehand. You can see he's taking a look up ice, pulls the puck off the yellow and allows the defenseman to skate in the puck and to be able to handle. It's important that you don't leave it on the yellow. If they can pick it up, pull it off the yellow a little bit makes it easier for the defenseman. So here's the overhead view of what the goalie sees on this one. He's got lots of time on a slow rim as the puck's coming. He can be taking his look and skating back into the boards like that so that he can see what's going on. And then it's important that he gets out of the way quickly. If he stops the puck on this side, he'll get it over there. If not, he might end up coming around that side, the other side. So we have another one here. Again, it's on his forehand. Here's Flurry. Stops it, gets it off the yellow, and now he's returning to the net this way. It allows the defenseman to pick up the puck and to be able to handle it cleanly. Now we have one on the backhand. So again, he's leaving it. This is Tristan Jari. He's going back, taking his look right now. Gets it, sets it up. He might pre uh, make a little bit of a screen here, prevent this guy from coming around. The defenseman picks it up and now he, he can make a play. Again, here's the overhead view of what the goalie's going to see. This was actually an offside play, which allows the goalie, he can anticipate that and get off to, a, you know, cheat on a little bit because this guy's, this guy's offside. So he's going to get it. He's taking his look now. He's looking up ice. There he looks again just to make sure he sees that his guy's coming to get the puck. Another one on the backhand. This is Alex Stalock, who's an excellent puck handler. He takes his look. And he just bumps it to the defenseman. But again, he's putting it, recognizing it, that the, it's a right-hand shooter and he's putting the puck here and not putting it up to the other side. And you want to make it as easy as possible for your defenseman or your forward who's coming back. Here's one on the forehand. There's no pressure on this play on the forecheck. Connor Ingham gets it. He stops it. He takes a look. Nice, easy play. Allows the defenseman to... Do what he wants. He can turn it up ice or he can come and set it up behind the net. Here's Igor Shesterkin. This is going to be cutting off a reset. You have to be a high level goalie to number one, want to be able to come out, but it, it's anticipating the play, anticipating that this guy doesn't have much to do with the puck. He sets it back. He stops it, gets it, makes a good pass to his defenseman. Now the defenseman can make it, make a play from there. Here we go on a slow rim. 
he's taking this look as he's going back. You see Saros, he sees his defenseman's there. Right away, he makes a play. And this is a this is rehearsed. We know that when the goalie's getting the puck, he, he's going to sorry, he's going to pass it to this area here. We want to hit it in that spot, allow the defenseman to pick up the puck. Now he can get his head up. He has lots of time because Saros moved the puck right away. The overhead view on this, it's just a little chip in. He's got lots of time, so he's taking his look as he's going back, but he makes his decision and makes his play right away. There's on a hard rim now. He's got to anticipate. Again, it's an offside play, so he's able to get a jump on it and get out. Stops it. Looks to check to see if the guy's coming this way. Lays it over. Now Nashville can go on their forecheck from there. Again, here's the overhead. Gets it. You see that you see our four checkers are heading this way. He cuts it off and is able to make a play and prevent this guy over here from getting hit. Another one. This one we're going over. Tristan Jerry stops it. Again, it's rehearsed. He's coming back here. He gets it, puts it right on the tape. Now he can make a play from that with the defensemen both splitting to the corners. Again, he takes his luck. Here's from the other end. Want to point out here, you see this defenseman right here, he's talking and he's pointing with a stick right there. He's calling an over, which allows Jerry to know to make the play over to that side. Here's Igor Sesterkin, he's got some time. He turns and faces up ice, which now allows him to make a pass this way or make a pass there. He's got a lot of patience. Our four checkers stop. He holds it, holds it, and now makes a play to his defenseman. Again, the overhead view. You got one four checker taking him away and Lawson Krause decides to stop and take the wall away. Shesterkin makes a great play there. Again, it's rehearsed as where these defensemen are going to go to so that the goalie has options. Now we're going to bypass the four checker. So as we see, four checker here, our defensemen don't have a lot of time. Ingram takes a look. He recognized that. Now he just bypasses on the yellow, gets it over to Christian Fisher, and now he can handle it from there. Another one was Shesterkin. He's taking his look as he's going back. Heavy four check with Lawson Krause and Michelli coming here. He uses his backhand in the glass and gets it around the boards. And now the battle's out, out, out high. Heavy pressure on this four check. We have three guys coming in. Shesterkin gets it. He sensed right away that he didn't have any time. One of these defensemen might be yelling hard. He just gets it, bypasses the forecheck, out to their forward, and away they go to start the breakout. I think a lot of, as we see it again here, heavy forecheck, he probably recognized that right away, that it's a heavy forecheck. I think a lot of goalies think they're good puck handlers by just every time rimming it around the glass. Uh, I wouldn't advise that they always do that, uh, unless you're telling your team that everyone's going to be coming around this side. I think to have some poise when you have time, but on a heavy four check like this, he doesn't have time to make a play and he makes the right, right decision. Here we got a what I call a soft rim. So it's a soft rim, the goalie can go back and he can be skating backwards or pivot and go backwards and be taking his look because by the time he gets the puck, he's gonna have to have made up his decision on what he wants to do. He took a look and saw these two guys were covered. So he's going to get it and right away. He's going hard in the glass. And then they actually able to get it out of the zone. So on that soft rim, the goalie pivots, can skate backwards, and he's taking a look up ice. If it's a hard rim, he's going to have to sprint to get out there. But then he's going to know that he has a second to get, to get control of the puck and take a look because the forecheck won't be on him quite as quickly. Here's one that's on the net. Again, Igor Shesterkin, which, who's an excellent puck handler, has the confidence here. He doesn't have any options to make a play. He's not going to pass it here. He's not going to pass it there. He goes up the middle to, I believe it's uh, Chris Kreider. Here you see it from this angle. He's making this play. If a goalie isn't as confident, he can go off the boards or off the glass and indirect over here. Sorry about that. 
another another way that you can help out is when you're on the power play, especially in the second period, it might not even be on the power play, but in the second period, um, whether it's a long change, we get caught here, Spencer Knight on the power play, up quick, all our guys are going to change and they actually come in and score a goal on this one. You can see it here, our guys are tired. Knight recognizes it, throw it up. Everybody's going this way, not how we want to make our change, but they catch us in a position where we didn't have a good change and he gets an assist out of it. It's a great way to, uh, again, I, I would, uh, you know, talk to your goalie about it. There are times where you don't want him to play it up during the power play just because you need to get a change. So it's not every time. Uh, here's Marc-Andre Fleury, who's a little bit different than everybody. He's got, uh, he's confident in whacking with one hand, nice easy play there. And then he does it again here against this under pressure. The puck's still rolling, he doesn't stop it. There's no other play, he's covered, he's covered. He's got the four check, he just whacks it with a little slapper over to his winger, which is a great play. And it's something that a young goalie might be able to do. If it's, it's hard to hold on to your stick with two hands with your glove. Uh, maybe just starting out basic, he can stop it with one hand and just a short, easy pass to, to a coach or to a defenseman there as he's working on it. A um, couple more here. Above the goal line, this comes into play for us because we can't play the puck when it's in this corner area. So Jari stops it above the goal line. we got pressure here, and he's just going to indirect it over to his defenseman here and allows him to have full control. Again, here's the view. He can see it right here. One four checker coming right on him. Makes his play, makes a good play and allows them to break it out. So those are some of the ways that um, we talk or I talk about with our goalies as far as the puck handling. I, I know it's some of it's high level, but you have to start at some point of being able to get out allowing your goalie to get out or encouraging him to get out to just stop rims, number one, be able to stop it, stop it, get control of it, pull it off of the yellow so that your defenseman has an opportunity to come and he's not digging it, digging it off the boards as he's coming in. As they get a little bit older and you want to have a more, a little more advanced and, it, and uh, if he can pass the puck well enough, well, then he can pass it to the same side, which we would call an up or you can go over to the other side, but you really need communication on the over. And that comes into your whole game plan as a, as a coach, whether you have your defenseman splitting to the corners or just coming back to pick up the puck behind the net. So from that, uh, that point, again, I wanna emphasize that a lot of goaltenders, they have some spare time or time when they're not being used in practice. I used to just, shoot pucks into the net. If something's going on at the other end, I wanted to get better at it. I might set two pucks up and just stick handle a little figure eight around two pucks or just work on my shot because it's hard to hard to get a grip on the on the stick with your glove. Uh, there's two different ways to do it. Most guys are cross hand. I don't want to get too detailed on that, but uh, it's not an easy thing to hold on to your stick as a goalie. So just remember that don't expect a young kid to be able to uh, put a lot on his passes or to be able to handle it really well. So, Christina, if you want to, if there's some questions um, from any of the coaches, whether it be on puck handling or anything else, uh, I'm open to any, any type of questions. All right, we've got one. Um, love that we're looking at what it takes for high level of decision making. One of the USA hockey coaching keys. Do you have some suggestions to help this decision making skill for goalies, whether it's a drill or off ice? Uh, the, I think the the main thing is just uh, working on the patterns with your defensemen. So just to understand, it, it's going to happen in a game. Like I said, if it's a if it's a hard rim, you're going to have more time. If it's a soft rim, you're going to have to make up your decision. I think it's more about just the pattern of stopping it, pulling it off the yellow. Second would be stopping it and making a play to your defenseman that's coming on the same side. And then that third level would be stopping it and an overpass to the other side. Um, 
I think if there's anything that, you know, if a, if a young kid is watching another game, if they stand behind the net or sit up in the, sit up in the bleachers behind the net and just recognize the four checkers, recognize where they're coming, listen to your own coaches as to how you want the four check. Some coaches might say, Hey, take both walls away. Well, then that's an opportunity for the defenseman just to come and pick up the puck every time. Excellent. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, we'd love to have them. Um, here's another one that just came in. Um, are there any things you look for in determining what paddle shaft height is appropriate for each goalie? Yeah, uh, the paddle height would be, I would measure it more for when the goalie is down in the butterfly. And once I think what I see uh, in a lot of youth hockey, from my experience being on, on the ice with my kids, I see a lot of young goalies that their paddle length is too high. So for those who, who uh, aren't familiar with it, there's different numbers on it. It might be 23, 24, 25. So what, what's going to happen is if the paddle length is 25 inches, when you drop down in the butterfly, now your blocker and your arm is up high. It's going to be hard to get your blocker down and your elbow in tight when you're in the butterfly. So that's the way for me to look at it. So a smaller goalie, if you're down in the butterfly, you want to be able to bring your elbows in and your sticks out in front of you a little bit, but that's one way to look at it. Uh, but I think in general, from what I've seen, a lot of goalies, they just go and whatever's at the store, you know, it, it's probably a lot for adults. There are junior sticks that are out there, which uh, I, I did have for my son, which that paddle length is, is shorter. Uh, and with these sticks that they are right now, there are some that you can shave it down a little bit. I understand you don't want to break a stick that you just paid a couple hundred dollars for and messed up on it, but there are ways to just shave it down with a file if, if, if you had to do it a little bit. Awesome. Um, do you have any routine puck handling drills? Um, I think the easiest way and a lot of community rinks, the... Uh, you don't get a true bounce all the time going around the, around the yellow of the boards. You know, it's not kept up. It's, it's not the same as an NHL rink where pretty much it's always, you're going to be able to let the puck rim and it's not going to take a bad bounce off of it. But what I try to do is I, I set up pucks just at the hash marks uh, on the boards, have the goalie staying behind the net so that they don't have to worry about skating back and forth, back and forth and getting tired out. And I'll just rim it into them slowly. Start out with it slowly, just so that they get the confidence to stop the puck, pull it, take a look, and give either give me a pass back or just rim it back around the around the boards to me. And I think that's uh, one thing to remember. If you're on your forehand, the puck's going to rim around the yellow and stay on it tight. If I'm on my I'm a left hand shot. If I'm on the right hand side, when I rim a puck, a lot of times the puck goes up on end. So if you find that the puck's not sitting flat for the goalie and you're on your off wing, try using your backhand. So if I'm a left-hand shot and I'm on the left hash marks, the left circle, I'm going to use my forehand so that it, it, it spins the right way. If I'm a, on the right-hand side, now because I'm a left shot, I'm just going to backhand it in and the spin's going to go uh, properly so that the puck lays flat for the goalie. But that's where I would, I would start with without having the goalie going back and forth from his crease, just having there, just the confidence of stopping it when the puck's coming slow. And as your goalie gets better and more confident, then you rim it a little bit harder each time. Fantastic. And then similar question, different spin on it. What are, what are warm up drills that you use um, that include the opportunity to handle the puck? Uh, like warm up for a game? Yeah. Yeah, we don't, uh, it's not something we really do. I know personally, when I went to uh, whatever rink I was in, uh, before we start our shooting drills, I'd take a couple pucks and I would, I myself would shoot it around the boards just to get a feel for, for, uh, for the boards, rimming it around the yellow, rimming it around the glass, just to see how those boards are with that particular rink. You could have one of your players rim one around just to see, okay, how are these boards? Are there any bad bounces? Sometimes you don't have a lot of time. And I know in youth hockey where you have three minutes or five minutes, you don't have a lot of time to waste on rimming some pucks around. 
Um, excellent. And then uh, I know that there are some younger youth coaches on the call. Um, what are some techniques that you think are really important in the very like primary stages of when players are learning the goaltending role? Like maybe they're just starting out learning it at the mites or squirts level. What are some really simple things that you think are important to review as a coach? Uh, number one for me is skating. Learn, learn to be able to skate your edge work in the crease. You can see how a goalie's edge work and skating would be important when they're getting out to handle the puck. A lot of, to me, it's about, it's about movement, movement on your skates so that you get comfortable moving side to side and moving in and out and then movement on your pads. Once they get a little bit older, I, I know that younger kids, they don't have the strength or technique to slide around on their pads like NHL goalies do. So movement on your skates. Um, and the other thing that I feel is extremely important is the ability to be able to catch a puck. Um, and a lot of times the goalie is scared of the puck and, you know, just to be able to gain the confidence to catch the puck and to learn that there's differences in the gloves. Not every glove you put on is going to feel the best to you or work the best for you or open up as much as you want. But for me, uh, and I did it with, uh, like I said, with any youth goalies that I'm on the ice with. Number one is, is skating and edge work. And number two, the ability to catch the puck, track the puck coming in and just using your hands overall. So it'd be catching the puck and using your blocker, just developing that confidence and to be able to react and not just hoping that the puck hits you. And, right. and when you're doing that, you know, there's got to be a lot of the coach that's shooting on a goalie understand that, hey, you know what, if the, if the goalie is eight years old or 10 years old, that you're not shooting it as hard as you can. There's a fear factor there that if you start shooting it and you're out of control and you zing and zinging him by his head, well, guaranteed the kid's probably going to be flinching. So you have to understand the age level of the kid that you're trying to, don't feel like it's too easy for him. Don't feel like it's too easy. You'll get a sense of, hey, you know what, this kid's got it and he's, he's, gaining confidence and I can shoot a little bit more and back up. You don't have to be super close back up, give the goalie time to be able to react and, and feel confident making the save. Excellent. Are there, are there any off ice tools that you recommend for goaltenders to utilize, to strengthen on strengthen themselves on ice? Um, as far as uh, the puck handling or just overall? Overall, you know what? I think it's important that whatever workouts the team are doing, when you have team workouts, dynamic workouts, that the goalie's doing that. There's, there's, uh, when it gets to just the goalie side of it, I think juggling is important uh, or bouncing balls off the wall. What you're doing is you're training your eye to track the ball, you're training your eye hand coordination. Uh, I was fortunate to grow up and, and play a lot of baseball in the summer, and I was a catcher. So I just had that many more reps of just being able to track a ball, track a ball without thinking, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm practicing here. It was more about playing. But I think for the goalies, it's important to develop a routine as far as your stretching, but any of the off-ice stuff, you can do the same strengthening uh, with the team. Now, if you need something else, I would focus on your groins and your hips, just some band work, um, and then doing some balls, bouncing balls and juggling balls, I think are great. Hey Corey, I I had one uh, one last question for you quickly here. Just as a one of the as a youth hockey coach, you know, when the kids get jump on the ice for their three minute warm up or their five minute warm up, obviously getting our goaltender um, as ready as we can is is a priority at that point. What what do you feel are the best type of drills that you can do for your goalie to your starting goalie certainly to in that short period of time to get him as ready as he can to to go out and compete. Well, I see a lot of different uh, patterns and different, I think uh, coaches have become creative to get all their players moving. It's important for me for the goalie, number one, that the shot comes from far enough out that they have time to react and get their eyes warmed up. And to me, that's above the top of the circles. Uh, number two is to be able to space the shots out. You know, if you want to be able to make the save and to be able to follow it in your body and then maybe see where it goes if you make the save, again, you're tracking it. So the two most important things for me are 
the distance that the shot's coming to be able to keep it out, I would say top of the circles or above. And number two, spacing them out. Um, so whatever drill that you want to do to be able to space that out and give the toe, give the goalie time to react and follow a puck versus rapid fire. And he's just standing there, not trying to make any save how he would in the game. Not, not feel rushed, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yeah, excellent. And you know what? It's the, I, what I found is at every level that players want to, the players want to score and warm up. They want to feel good too. So if you can give the, the goalie the first drill, hey, you know what? We're going to take long shots. This is for you. You got to focus on, you know, tracking the puck in, making sure you make clean saves. And then you move into the next drill. And now the guys are a little bit closer because, I mean, it's not just all about the goalies. You want the guys to feel confident going in as well. Real good, real good. Christina, do we have any other questions? That's all. Thank you so much, Corey. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks to all the coaches out there for the, for the time you put in to help these uh, young kids. It doesn't matter what level they're at. You never know which ones are going to make it and or make it as far as they can in their career. You, not everybody's going to make the NHL, but if you have an impact on, on each kid in a small way, and hopefully they get to the, be the best of their ability down the road, uh, you can look back and uh, you've helped develop the next generation of hopefully players that move on to play pro hockey. And if they're lucky, the NHL. Thanks so much for your time, Corey. We appreciate right. it. Thank you. All right. Now it is Joe's turn. <laughs> All right. Get to follow up the goalie guy. I tell you what, Corey is a first class human being as well. I, he just talked about influencing and, and, um, you know, being active in young kids' life. And I actually had a chance to work with the 14 Western uh, Regional High Performance Camp that we run here in Colorado Springs with uh, the Rocky Mountain kids. And he was on the ice with us and we were doing a lot of the, you know, ADM recommendations. We were having a great practice. And, you know, he goes, and he pulled me aside. He goes, you know what, Joe, I'm from North Battleford, Saskatchewan. If I would have had half of this stuff when I was a kid, I, I might I might have been a big time goal scorer. He was, and he was so into it and, and just seeing a former pro like him giving back to the kids, really adding energy to practice. It's, it's world-class and there's no, there's no mistake why these NHL guys make it to the NHL. Cause not, they're, they're not just good hockey players. They're just fantastic people. So I'll get into this, Christina. Um, I appreciate the time today. Um, I just want to remind everybody, this is part two now of what I did. I think the two calls ago uh, when coach do Hamill was on, um, if you can remember, we did some stuff on breakouts and I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to pick up where I left off. But before I do, I just want to let all the people know that are on here for the level five, or I'm sorry, for continuing ed credits. I just want to like kind of let you know where you stand and what some of our thoughts are in terms of our CEP stuff. As you know, for continuing ed, that's once you reach level four or level five. And if you're on a, a national bound roster, we're going to start asking for continuing ed credits. So, so many of the people that are on this call are earning continuing ed credits with this great education. And just as a reminder, our CEP and our education has really evolved. It's not death by PowerPoint anymore. And if you haven't taken some CEP recently, highly suggest maybe maybe taking delving back into it and taking some USA Hockey CEP because it's, it's just like we asked the coaches to make it player-centered, we have made it coach-centered. And you're engaged in your uh, learning. It's more about the coach and helping you become a better coach than us telling you what to coach. And just as a reminder, if you're a level one coach, we feel you should be comfortable running a station. I would argue that's not even coaching. That's just running a station, keeping the kids active, you know, and executing, uh, you know, the drill. As a level two coach, you should understand basic drill design, you know, work rest ratio. What is the drill asking of the players? Can you tone it up or tone it down? Um, you know, and can you think about problems that your kids are having and then design a drill that might help them out as a level three coach, you know, you're focusing on practice design. I feel the designers in a hockey club are the most important coaches, right? Anybody can repeat a drill and sometimes it's not even an appropriate drill, but if you can understand what do your players need and focus on designing a practice and creating an environment 
to give to your players what they need. Now we can start talking player development, right? So we're asking clubs even to even get away from just giving some basic drills to your coaches, but try to help your coaches become drill designers. And then as a level four, can you link practices together to get actual learning, actual change in behavior over the course of a year? And so just as a reminder, if you're a level three or four coach, you should be hovering in those areas and having a big influence on your club. Okay, as a reminder, part one, when I came on last time, we talked about, do you have the ability to develop individual players within a team environment? Unlike these pro coaches, you are not getting a finished product and you're only going to skate with your players probably for three hours a week, right? And then if you, so if you only have 60 minutes times three during one week, how do you develop the individual player? But then you also have the pressure and the duty to organize your team. And USA Hockey has made big, big strides in this area on how we're delivering coaching and our definition of skill. And last call that I was on, we talked about the definition of skill, and I'll just repeat it just to remind everybody what it was. It has three pillars. There's technique, skate, shoot, pass, stick handle. It has thinking, somebody already said it, that decision-making piece. Do your players have the ability to make a lot of decisions in practice, right? Not only for reading and reacting, but can your players manipulate and break down the opponent, right? And then the final pillar is, can they actually perform in a live environment when somebody's checking them, stealing the puck or knocking their head off? Can they actually play and, and make the right reads and have the right technique to let them execute right? Their technique in a live game. So if you understand where we're going with skill, it's not just technique. It's not just skate through a cone, shoot, get back in line. We talked about it. That's a practice player. Those players don't show up in games. Those players cost coaches jobs because they can't think. Okay. So as a reminder, the, the, what's on my screen right now, that environmental design continuum Remember what we talked about? We don't want to be stuck in that lower bottom corner. I'm not saying anything's wrong with blocked drills. Kel McCarr or Clayton Keller, I'm sure, work on one-timers after practice all the time getting a, a coach, right? That's working on their technique of a one-timer, right? That's a low-level block drill, stick handling around cones, five-on-oh breakouts. What we're working with coaches now is can you get up and down this continuum based on what your players need? Can you add complexity? Let's stop using the excuse, I can't coach my team because I have to do station-based drills. We're asking coaches now to modify. Can you, can you get away from blocked and add opposition? Get into small unit play and touch your, teach your concepts and habits. Get into small-sided games with intent. Well, USA Hockey wants me to do small area games, so I'm just going to stand here and play three-on-three three, you know, all season. That's not what we're saying. OK, and we had a really good discussion on this last time. Actually, it wasn't a discussion. It was a one way presentation because it's not a discussion. But if you took our CEP classes, those are discussions we're having. How do you structure your environment now to get to that macro game? OK, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to go back to that that stupid, simple red wing breakout. OK, but I'm going to shift gears on you people. It's easy for me to say, hey, this is the red wings breaking the puck out. How, Let's just do this with our kids. Well, that doesn't really make sense because you're not dealing with Red Wing players or NHL players. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through this now. My intent as a Bantam coach two years ago, not with a AAA team, but not with a house team. It was a good Bantam A team that ended up finishing very strongly in Colorado as a Bantam AA team. Talk more about them in a second. How do I, as a youth hockey coach, it put structure in with my team and have an intent to break the puck out like the Red Wings, okay? So now as we watch this clip, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this clip. Actually, I'm going to pause it. And, no, I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this clip. And now what I want to share, like you guys heard Coach Schwab talk about, leave it. That's a coaching cue. And I'm a big believer in having simplified coaching cues for your players so everybody's on the same page. We don't read the kids the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. We get to the point, we're clear communicators, we, we talk in coaching cues and bullet points. So we're on the same page. So as I showed my team this, my band and my 14U team, here's what we're talking about. Obviously, there's got to be a skill level and there's got to be a technique to get the puck up off the wall. Last time we showed this clip, we talked about how many reads that actually go into a breakout to exit the zone with five or six guys 
with puck possession with speed. It's a lot. We talked about that last time. But now let's talk about the system or the structure. So as soon as we see this defenseman gets the puck, right, beats the first four check, the read for my players at the Bantam U level, 14 U level, is fast break breakout, similar to basketball. It's time to get out of the zone, right? So you can see our center is slow and in control. He's going to put his stick right on the ice there. He's showing him where he wants it. He's probably telling him where he wants it. But these guys are in breakout mode right now. So we have slow and in control, okay? We have our strong side winger slides as close as he can to the blue line without getting swallowed by the four check. But he also slides high enough to take these three guys out of the picture, which he does. One pass beats three guys, right? Weak side winger uh, pushing the pace, weak side defenseman uh, activating. So we have center slowing in control, strong side winger slide, weak side winger push the pace, weak side uh, defenseman activating. We are creating a modern four on two because in the NHL, that's what they're doing, right? We talked all about this stuff last time about positionless hockey or interchangeable hockey and, and the debate that we're having on is that, all right? So as the Red Wings come out, you can see they get puck possession and away they go. So as I said, that's real easy to talk about the Red Wings, right? With the NHL clip with uh, HD TV and all that kind of stuff. Let's watch a pretty damn good Bantam team. Not great, not bad, but pretty good. Okay, now have success breaking the puck out like the Red Wings but keeping a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in mind, developing individual players within the team environment. How do you structure your team is what I'm getting at. So let's watch the black defenseman. He comes back on the puck. He surrounds it. He has enough confidence to beat the guy one-on-one. -on -one. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Hold on. Okay. So the black defenseman comes back and get it. Black jersey defenseman. I'm going to pause it right there. Okay. So Defenseman gets the puck up off the wall. Look at our winger. I would rather have them funnel down the middle of the ice, but they came down the walls, which is decent. This was kind of our first week of the, the uh, of the season. Look at our center, though. Slow and in control. Showing him where he wants it. Tell him when he wants it. Defenseman's in front of the net, ready to jump. Weak side ringer's making that exact same read the Red Wings did, and he's about ready to push the pace. So our defenseman beats the four check, just like that Red Wing guy did. Okay, he attacks the second four checker with his toes up ice, which is beautiful because now he has two options, middle or wall. Okay, but he influences the four check. He freezes the four check. Oh, God dang it. Why is it doing that? Sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry. This isn't great stuff here. Okay, let me pause it right okay, right there. Okay, he has two options. He passes the puck up the wall. You can see the center is a great puck support position. You can see push the pace is putting pressure on the white team. Our weak side D is jumping a little late, but not bad. And then we go uh, defenseman, winger to the center, and away we go. Okay. So just to prove that that's not a fluke, let's watch the same game, same team. Okay. Pucks in the far corner. Okay. Look at the net front defenseman now. Opens up. Great puck support right there. Chest is facing the puck. Stick is on the ice. Showing him where he wants it. Now we go D to D. Look at our center, slow and in control. Skates are in the blue paint. Stick is on the ice, showing him where he wants it, telling him where he wants it. Our winger's a little bit low there, 67, but now he starts to slide, right? Just like we talked about. Now we go D to D, now we go middle, and now we go push the pace for a good breakout. So the reason why I'm showing that is not to brag. The reason why I'm showing that is to get all the naysayers to say we can't coach. I would challenge youth hockey coaches that with the stuff that we're promoting and we're asking coaches to do is you can really roll your sleeves up now and coach. So let's take a step back. We talked about this game last time. I'm not going to talk much about it, but we talked about that two on two breakout game. This now is getting into a little bit of club structure as well. If you have, if you have a 14 U coach that's there every year, your 14 U coach better be interested with your eight U's, 10 U's and 12 U's are doing in practice in order to get an end result where you can actually coach style of play and concepts and habits, okay? So remember what we talked about the definition of skill is. The technique, right, the reads, the brain, and then the ability to perform in a live environment. So this stupid little game here, we talked about last time, it's two on two. We draw a line down the middle, right? And the only rule is you have to make one pass on the defensive side before you can go on offense. So as we talk about constraints-led approach, all we're doing is shrinking space to give our kids more opportunity 
to do whatever it is that you want them to do. You're the architect of your environment. So in this drill here, if I'm coaching 10U, 12U, maybe even 8U advanced, I am running this to teach in-game, real-life puck support, right? Because we talked about last time, if we didn't have that line, someone's going to cheat and go stand by the goalie, which I actually like that player because I like guys that kind of cheat offense. That's me personally. But I'm going to put a line down the middle because I want a five-foot pass. I want the chest facing the puck here. I want the stick on the ice. And I want kids in a live environment working on puck uh, support and getting a whole bunch of chances to make that pass technical and go get open into open space, hockey sense with two people for checking live environment. Okay. And so you build on this. Okay. So if we go to practice, we shot this in Omaha just a couple of weeks ago, but this is what you're going to see. Now, the first time these kids have ever run this game, it's kind of fascinating. Watch the great kid right here opens up. Look at this little five foot puck support situation. Stick on the ice, and away they go, okay? Red has the puck now, okay? Look at the red partner here, okay? He's got to find space because his partner's under uh, uh, pressure. For some reason, the puck ends up on the wall. That's not great. Gray wins kind of at the four check right now. Now look what happens. Red breaks away into open space, but let's watch what his partner does. He doesn't sit there and watch. He breaks to open space now, okay? Now they get the little five-foot pass, and away red goes. Same thing back now, good puck support all over the ice. Now they're going to use the net. Now they're going to open up. Now they're going to make a pass and away they go. So the environment that's created here is the environment to teach puck support. So as a coach, that, that's what you're um, reinforcing and that's really what you're working with the kids. So once they get that, now how do you progress? How do you grow the game to make it more complex? So what I do, and again, this is my interpretation I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but this is my interpretation of the constraints led approach, trying to develop individuals within a team environment, knowing our definition of skill and getting every second I can out of a 60 minute practice because I know I only have three practices a week with the best players in my town, right? And just for the record too, to, in order to get those clips of those breakouts, did I do five on O breakout? Yes, I did. Four times that year, I counted. Three before Halloween, one after Christmas because our breakouts started to suck. Did we do video? Yes, we did. I showed that Red Wing video clip probably 10 times to my team. Did we do walkthroughs out in the parking lot so they could get their lanes and see what the final product was? 100%. But what I'm showing you now is really where the magic occurs. And this is where the learning occurs. And this is where that brain and decision making occurs. I would argue the clips that I showed you of my team my team was more organized, was more fundamentally sound in the, the definition of skill, technical passes, thinking, playing in a live environment. And they were definitely more organized than the other team's forecheck was. Therefore, we were allowed to break out the puck pretty damn quick. Okay. So now in this progression here, we're going to use the net. Okay. Now, in order to cross the line, you have to skate around the net and you have still have to make one pass before you hit the dotted line. And you're probably going to want to stay on sides if you're at 10U. Because so parents know that you're teaching off sides because we know that really drives people nuts when kids don't stay on sides. Okay, so you can see the progression. I like defensemen that can use the net, that can cut the net and shed a four check, right? I like defensemen that can come around the net and snap a pass tape to tape, scanning the ice with his eyeballs. So those are the things now that we're starting to teach. And once they're successful at that, now I start to add a real hard blue four check in and now I start coaching my four check. F1 is aggressive. That's just how we are. Again, what is the intent of the small area game? And I'm telling you what my personal intent is as I try to organize my team. Two or three weeks of this, they're going to have success. And now it's time to move on. Now we can start to get into the Red Wing stuff. Okay. I would say this drill here, if I went back to college coaching, I would do this quite a bit. It, when I coached 12U hockey, we did this drill minimum one time a week. And we're doing high school, local high school stuff. Now we're doing it minimum one time a week. So now it's the same drill. It's the two on two, but now you put your two defensemen behind the net. Okay. Now, before they can leave the zone, they have to kick it back to the D. The D can either go right back up or D to D. If we go D to D, now you can start using your coaching cues. Strong side wing or slide, weak side wing, push the pace, or slow and in control, whatever it is that you want to teach. And what's going to happen when you start off with this, your dopey defensemen behind the net are going to put the puck on the wall. They're going to put it on their backhand. They're going to make backhand passes. They're going to give their partner a bunch of crap as passes. 
So that's the coaching point. How do you get an efficient defenseman going D to D up, going right up and hitting tape to tape passes very quickly. Then once they get that, then you add the four check. Now one of those blue guys has to four check hard. Now it's pressure, right? And what's interesting about this setup, and somebody said it right off the call when they asked Coach Schwab about decision-making. This type of setup here, half ice with a four check with your defenseman crammed against the wall, their brain has to go like this, right? I am taking away time and space on purpose because not only am I in the business of making sure they know how to physically pass, I'm in the business of making sure they know how to think decide and read what the right play is right up D to D middle or hit my slide. And it happens quick. Okay. So once you master this, I think we have video of this. You'll see some beautiful stuff here as we go through this. So here's the drill. I like that. This drill starts off with a 50, 50 puck red beats it back to their defenseman. Okay. D they go D to D look at the red defenseman coming across the center of the ice. He's hitting the hole hard. He's slowing in control. Right, it sticks down on the ice. They don't see it, but they hit the second guy. Pretty good breakout. I take that all day long. D to D, up the middle. Okay, red now attacks. They kind of get a little bit of offense. Um, they bring it back again, which, okay, now they go D to D again. Now they go D to D. Look at the puck support. Kids are opening up. Kids are supporting, making good attacks on the net, just making good reads. Gray defenseman has the puck now. Okay, now they go D to D. You can see the one red's four checking. So we're getting brain development. Look at the gray player opening up D to D, hits the wing sliding, quick two on O. So you're getting a lot of looks here. Um, again, if you create the right environment and you have the right intent. Now I'm really into the Detroit Red Wings. Now, as we go and we go D to D, we put the puck up into the hands of the winger or the center, it doesn't matter. We got our four check going. Now we get our weak side wing activating and he's creating a three on two, okay? The way I coach my defenseman and my recommendation would be, I wanna coach my defenseman the way I coach in the game. So I tell my defenseman, jump the rush. You can be middle lane drive, you can be dot lane, you can be third guy high. If you get a sniff at offense, awesome. If not, you get back into your position back behind the net, just like I would in the game. You're up, you're attacking. If it happens, great. If not, you're back. So I'm getting the behavior that I want by constraining and adding rules to the game and giving these kids in-game knowledge. Chalk talks are in-game or knowledge of the game. Watching video is knowledge of the game. Environments like this, you're giving your kids for 60 minutes in practice knowledge within the game, which is priceless. Soon as they master this, I think I got a quick video here real quick. So now you're going to see the defenseman jumping. So you're gray. Now they go D to D. Now the defenseman, he's a little bit slow to anticipate. Soon as the pass is made, now he's gone. So you can see the quick three on two. Puck turns over. Red goes um, uh, D to D. Look at their defenseman jump. A little cross and drop, a little tack on the net. I take those players all day long at 12U. It's pretty good. Then once they get comfortable with that, now you can open up and start modifying your space with fuller ice. I would normally ask the question here, if I start to go full ice here, or if I put the net on the goal crease and at, at the uh, center ice red line and go three on three and play that exact same game, the decisions, once I open the game up like this, does it, the decisions don't become, the, they aren't the same. They're actually slower. And you're going to see your defensemen and your players are going to be hitting holes twice as fast because the four check can't get to them like it can on the small ice. So again, remember what I said, we're not asking coaches to stay in a six station practice and be locked so you can complain you can't coach. What we're asking coaches to do is can you get up and down that spectrum? Can you layer progression? Do you have intent when you run a drill? Maybe it is stick handling. Maybe it is one-on-one -on -one play. Maybe it is outside edges. Maybe it is breakout. Maybe it is power play or four check. But do your drills have the intent? And are you teaching what that concepts and habits and style and play during your practice? And again, I would argue that the beauty of coaching um, is really amazing when you start having an intent and start layering on. If your players struggle, okay, if the answer is no, uh, then step in, add complexity, add a new concept. Like I said, now let the defenseman jump, put the defenseman behind the net, add a four check. 
right? Shrink the area, increase the area. Have opportunities for recall. Talk to the kids. If they're not progressing, okay, step in and take off complexity. Change something to make it easier and ask questions. Don't be the coach that gives the answers. Ask questions, check for understanding, and see if the kids actually understand maybe what you're, what you're trying to do. So that was a real shotgun approach. I know I kind of went fast with that. But if you've been away from USA Hockey for a while, we are not the old ADM of cookie cutter stations, blue puck, helmets on coaches. Now, the blue puck is still a rule, but that's what everybody thought the ADM was 13 years ago, right? Where you've moved on now, how do we empower coaches? It's not what you're coaching, it's how do you coach? Can you, do you understand the new definition, not the new, but a good definition of skill? Can you create environments? Can you design environments and drills to get the behavior of the team that you want to get with limited time at the rink per week? And if you understand those, some of those things, and if some of the, if the light bulb's going off with you right now, now we can start talking player development at a, at a pretty good level where you can start seeing a lot of improvement, not just with the one timer, or just not with skater guys skating around cones, but kids that can actually think and manipulate and play the game in a live environment. So when the puck drops on Saturday, you can enjoy your coffee and let the kids do the thinking. Christina, I'm going to bring it to an end there. I know it was pretty quick. I was talking fast, but a lot of the stuff that the Arizona coaches, NHL guys are doing, they're working with the final product. And just as a reminder, you're not working with the final product. Just make sure that you're developing skilled players, competitive players and hungry players and kids that want to play hockey. And we appreciate everybody here that's getting their continuing ed. And thanks a lot, Christina. All right. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions for Joe? We don't have any questions in the box just yet. No I think. questions, but uh, it's always wonderful for us to, to listen to Joe. He's one of the best at USA hockey. He, he definitely is engaging and, and makes you think. And, and uh, certainly um, I feel like I want to go out and run a practice right now with uh, some <laughs> of the new concepts that he can uh, bring to bring to light for you. So keep up the good work, Joe. It's awesome. We appreciate Thank, it. Thanks, Mike. And you know, when it's clubs like yours and it's clubs or it's states like Arizona and you know, I'm proud to represent west of the Mississippi pretty much. And the, you know, what the um, the growth mindset, people that are pretty much open to new ideas um, out west, it's real refreshing. We're making huge strides and we're making huge strides as a country, but we're making huge strides as Rocky Mountain as well. I'm extremely proud of everybody within our region. And I really pre appreciate the collaboration with the Phoenix Coyotes, yourself and Christina. So thanks for saying that. Absolutely. All right, uh, we haven't had any questions in the box. And so I will let everyone go. We are at the hour mark anyway. So I, I think everyone's definitely gotten um, gotten the value out of this call for sure. So thank you so much again, Joe. And uh, we'll see you all in the next one. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. You guys are awesome. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Shane. See you guys. Thanks, everyone.